Galatians chapter 3, verses, I'm going to cover only verses 25 to 29, but I wanted you to read what was before. We've covered that, but it's been a while since we've been back in uh, Galatians, so here we are. I've called this message, Privileged People. Privileged People. We all want to be a part of a, a successful company, a successful family, a successful business, uh, a team that's usually the one that's easiest, right? The, the team spirit. Uh, where are you going for? The heat or the spurs? I mean, that's, uh, they're coming up uh, for the finals. Are you a Dallas Cowboy fan? If not, get out. <laughs> I mean, we all have our teams, right, that we want to be a part of. Uh, and there's no, nothing wrong with that. We all want to be a part of something that's, that's, that's a unity and we want to be successful, uh, part of a team. Uh, and we have to ask the question, well, what unites us? What unites us? Well, in a big way, our culture, right? We're Americans. If you have someone coming from Mexico, they've got their culture. They've got somebody from China, from Japan. You know, they all have their cultures, and cultures unites people. There's customs and celebrations and traditions and special days that unite us as Americans. Fourth of July, we celebrate. Mexico does not. You know, Cinco de Mayo, they said we don't celebrate. You know, I mean, we have our various things and they, it, it unites us. A uh, set of laws uh, unites us. You know, we, we run our country a certain way, other countries in a, in a different way. That, that unites us. Uh, biological ties. Family, very strong, right? We, and and uh, they're legitimate. It, it's right. Uh, we want to be a part of a family. And uh, that's very, very powerful. Very powerful. Uh, profession. Uh, you know, you're roofers, uh, accountants, engineers, and you have meetings, and pastors have meetings just for pastors, and, you know, so your profession. Uh, sometimes it unites you with others. Same values. We might have, you know, different companies or whatever, but if we have the same values, then we, that unites us. Uh, and all those things unites us at some level, but not at the deepest, most critical level. In fact, when we begin to rely upon those other ways of uniting, whether it's a company or a biological family or what have you, the chances are, listen to this, the chances are you're going to feel left out. Or you're going to fear that you're not good enough. That really happens with just about any unity. I don't know how many women that I talk to express the very same thing. <sighs> Nobody likes me. I feel different. I feel odd. It's like, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. They feel always different. And they want to be a part of what unites them. But we're always, if we go by that, we're going to fear that we're not good enough or we're going to be left out. Why didn't my family call me? Why didn't my co-workers, they got together and they didn't call me? Uh, that church group over there got together and we didn't even know about it. Oh, I'm hurt. Or, you know, it's, it's going to happen. Now, God has always been at work at putting us as part of a family because He knows that sin has made a mess of things. Um, and this work of God, it touches the deepest longings of all of us but it's the most effective. It's the most effective. Uh, are business associations wrong? Connections? No. Are family ties wrong? No. Uh, all these other ways, culture, are they all wrong? No, no. They just come short. In fact, they le leave us high and dry. And some of us know what it means to be left out or be rejected by family even. Biological family. And the problems that are there. 
And God says, I understand that and I have been working to unite you in such a way that is the real most effective way. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul has been addressing the Corinthians because there were in a lot of divisions among them uh, and he's been trying to see, show them how they're really united. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 25, Paul says that there should be no divisions in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And so it is. I mean, he took the analogy of a, of a physical body and the way it works. I guarantee you, you take your little pinky, take a hammer, and smash it. See if your glutes don't hurt. <laughs> See if your ear doesn't hurt. Your whole body is like, ah, you're screaming because the whole body works together. And God says, look, I am building this body in such a way that the whole body cares for each other. So that if one member is hurting, the whole body is hurting. If one member is being honored, the whole body rejoices with it. And that is God's work. And it is much more powerful, much more powerful than any other associations, any other connections that we may have, as powerful as they are. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, I don't, I've used this passage countless of times because it is so common to have family breakups and rejection and pain within the family. And uh, this is one of those really amazing passages. This is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 46. Matthew 12 and verse 46. While he was still speaking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and his brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. He was in the middle of ministry, right, doing the will of God, and here comes his relatives, literally his mother and his brothers. They, they wanted to take him away. They wanted to take him away. And someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But he answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? What? Who's my real family? Who's my real family? And stretching out his hands towards his disciples, he said, Behold my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Wow. Spiritual family is thicker than biological blood. Spiritual family is thicker than biological blood. But that is very, very difficult for us to understand. Because we're so used to whatever, however we're brought up in the world and the physicality of our lives. And the biological connections and there's a mysterious emotional connection that we have with our biological families. But Jesus is saying something very, very radical here. It's the work of God when He redeems people and they begin to follow the Lord. That is thicker than biological blood. Those who are doing the will of my Father who is in heaven. Wow, to break with that. To break with the biological family when, when they are not wanting to do the will of God. It's just tough, but there it is. And so, this is an ongoing thing. And so you and I need to ask the question, what about the church, the body of Christ? How, what's your attitude towards the church? Because you see, in our times, the church is being rejected big time. Right? The church is being rejected big time. Organized religion is terrible. 
terrible. Religion, oh, I hate it. And organized religion is used in contemptuous ways. If there's a big assembly of believers getting together, some young people that don't want anything to do with any church. And suspicion at least when there's a church gathering. I remember telling me, somebody telling me that for years they drove by this church. And you know what their attitude was? Look at them. They even have bushes all the way around their church. How dare they? Who do you think they are? They didn't even know us. But that was their attitude. Look at them. Their buildings all look nice and they think they're hot stuff. Like, <laughs> automatically rejecting us. You see? Well, you and I can begin to have some of the same attitudes without knowing it. Um, where are you in your relationship with the church? Uh, where are your friends? Your co-workers in relationship to the church. If you invite them, how do they react? Why is it that we're afraid to really invite people to church? They're skeptical. They're wounded. They're afraid. They're going to be judged. And then they see all kinds of hypocrisy and so forth. And it's like, but this is the work of God. Are you a part of the living word that really engaged and supporting? And if not living word, wherever you go to church? Do you rejoice about being part of the church? Do you really rejoice inside so much so that you see that ah, other people need this church? Other people need the church and you rejoice? Is that the way it is? Or is there some reservations and questions and... You see, we all are part of that. And God is saying, I came to build my church. And the Apostle Paul has been wrestling with the Galatians with that very question. The Galatians wanted to go back to legalism. They wanted to go back to religion. You know? They wanted to go back to religion. <laughs> I'm amazed how many times I've been talking to someone and no, they don't want to go to church because... There's a bunch of hypocrites there. And, uh, you know, they just want to play religion. You know, do they have all these things they have to do? And then I ask them, well, um, why do you think God should accept you when you, you die? Well, you know, I've done, I've done good. I'm not like those people over there. I, you mean you've done good enough to try and please the ultimate one? You know what that is? That's religion. That is religion. When you think that you've been good enough and you've been working because you want to have more good than bad, that's religion. That is religion. You're being religious. <laughs> Paul was fighting against the Galatians thinking and wanting to go back to the Old Testament law. And in the previous passage, from what we're going to cover tonight, Paul had argued that, you know, the, the law had its, had its purpose. It was a limited power that it had. It was good, but it was limited. The law was to lead us to Christ. Why? Because the law says, look, you have to do everything perfect. If you're going to live by the law, you have to do everything perfect. Never fail once. Who can do that? Nobody. So the law would show us, I need a Savior. If somebody's going to go by do's and don'ts and by religion, the law says, okay, let's try you. Here's what you're supposed to do, day in and day out. God prescribed everything of our life. Now do it perfectly. Oops. <laughs> That's right. The law showed us that we need a Savior. There in Galatians 3, it says the law was our tutor leading us to Christ. Leading us to Christ. And when we come to Christ, now we are a part of the family. You see? We are a part of the family. And so we pick it up. I say verse 25 and 26, the means for spiritual family. The means for the spiritual family. In other words, how do we get there? 
And then uh, verses 27 to 29, the result of God's work. The result of God's work. The Apostle Paul had been arguing that the way of Christian faith, listen to this, the way of Christian faith is the way to freedom and life and righteousness and peace. All this was done uh, not by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ. That's what he's been arguing. Look, the Christian life, it's awesome. It's for freedom and, and righteousness and peace and life. But it doesn't come by the works of the law, by the do's and don'ts. And what we have in this passage is this. Through Christ, believers are placed in a great position of acceptance and privilege. Those who have trusted in Christ are placed in a position of acceptance and privilege. And don't we all want to be accepted? That's why we dress the way we do. That's why we talk the way we talk. Sometimes that's why we drive what we drive. Because we're going to be accepted. And we're going to see it's honorable and, and, and prestigious something. I'm going to wear these clothes so that I'm accepted. Or here, in verses 25 to 29, what we find is, through Christ, believers are placed in a great position of acceptance and privilege. Look at verse 25 now. Galatians chapter 3, verse 25. Uh, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Now, isn't that kind of like a, a strange phrase? Now that faith has come, like, wasn't there faith before Jesus came? <laughs> what does that mean? Now that faith has come. And what that means is this. Before, there was a system by which you kept the law and this is the way you were connecting with God. Now there is a new system. Now there's a system of faith in Christ. So, now that faith has come, now that there's a new system of relating with God. Before it was the law, now it's through the gospel, through Christ. You see? And uh, there's supposed to be a submission to that way. A, a, an obedience of the gospel. That is, an obedience that this is the way God saves us. Because it's hard. Imagine that. I said it before. For hundreds of years, hundreds of years, the way that people were to connect with God was through the law. Keeping of sacrifices and the Sabbath and all these rules and regulations. That was the system. Now that's being done away with, and now there's a new system, faith in Christ. What? That's right. And so that's the meaning there, and we are to submit to that. And I'll say more about that because some of us don't want to submit to a life of faith. We want to keep the old ways. You see, I've done life this way all the time. I brush my teeth this way. I buy my food this way. I, I look this way. I everything. And you're changing all that? Brr, no! And so we don't live a life of faith. We don't live a life of freedom. You see? We're stuck in our old ways. But here Paul says, now that faith has come, verse 25, we are no longer under a tutor. What was the tutor? The law. The law was the tutor. And what was the law teaching us? They were sinners. The law showed us, man, we, we mess up. We can't do it. We, we, I am powerless. Over and over and over and over. We're no longer under that. You know what? I know I'm going to fail. But praise be to God for forgiveness through Christ. I don't have to be all worried about being accepted. Because I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm accepted in Jesus. You see? That was the means. Um, and then he says in verse 46... I mean, 26. 
For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. What is that? You're all sons of God. What does that sound like? Like a family. You are now sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the point. That's what God is after, to create this family, this connection, this unity. Why? Because we all long for that. We all long for that. We may not want to admit it because if I admit it, now I'm going to be vulnerable. Now I'm going to be vulnerable. Oh, now you know my needs. Now you know my weaknesses. And no, I don't need anybody. No, I can do it on my own. No, we all long for that. Just take a look when you're not invited somewhere where you thought you were going to be invited. We all get hurt. Or some people are talking over in their little group and we're not a part of that. Uh, why not? Why are, what are they talking? They're talking about me. <laughs> we all long to be a part of, of, of a family. You see? And Paul here is saying, look, we're no longer under the, the old way of connecting with God. Now it's through Christ, and you are all sons of God. Through faith, and he keeps nailing faith. Why? Because it is so easy to go by the law. It may not be the Old Testament law for you and me, but it may be the law of how I'm going to dress. How I'm going to talk how I'm supposed to do my hair, how I'm supposed to drive a car, and what type of a car, and those are law to ourselves. No, we're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's a new way to live, you see. Sons of God. Now, what are the results of this? Um... He kind of spells it out a little bit more as far as the family of God. Verse 27, For all of you were baptized into Christ, having clothed yourselves with Christ. Uh, We were all baptized. We're all baptized to Christ. Um, That's the body of Christ. We're baptized into the body of Christ, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We're all baptized into one body. And by the way, that's not the physical water. Uh, just to make sure, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and um, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, We're all made to drink of one spirit. What does that tell you? It's not physical. It's the spiritual baptism. When we have baptisms up here on Easter or other times, I'm doing the baptizing. I I don't look like the Holy Spirit. Let me guarantee you that. (laughs) It's the Holy Spirit that does the spiritual baptism. What we do out here is more the outward physical uh, symbol of what has taken place spiritually already. But here, we're all baptized. If you go back to Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, we're all baptized, it says, into Christ. Uh, We become members of the family of God. It's not a matter, listen to this, it's not a matter of, uh, okay, let me fellowship more and fellowship more and fellowship more, and now I'm going to become a part of the body. No. That's how we may experience more of the body, but the moment you trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit takes you and puts you into the body of Christ. It's already a community. It's already a deep fellowship. We just need to work at experiencing that more and more. But the reality is already, you were already baptized into the body of Christ. And then it says, um, you clothed yourselves with Christ. You clothed yourselves with Christ. I quote from uh, one of the commentaries, at least means to be vested with righteousness and familial 
membership. Righteousness is evidenced by the fact that believers no longer need a tutor, verse 25, and familiar membership is evidenced by the fact that there is no more distinction before God. All believers are members of God's family, verse 28. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, we put on Christ. Now, for this, I want you to turn to way in the front of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Some of you might remember by heart what happened after Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, God cursed them, and then God did something besides cursing them. Uh, when he finished the curse to Adam, Genesis chapter 3, and verse 19, For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Verse 20, now the man called his wife named Eve because she was the mother of all the living. And look at verse 21. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now there was shame. Now there was alienation. Now there was broken relationship. And God in His grace clothed them. Right? Now turn over all the way to the New Testament again. To 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, and brothers and sisters, again, this is something, these are true that if we just live by them, they can become so much freedom in life for us. This is not just good information for the brain. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 and 31. But by His doing, right? By Christ's doing, by God's work, but by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is God's work. It's not that we gain our own righteousness. This is what God has been doing for us as believers and as a family. You see? Sometimes I wish, oh, I wish I was a better parent, a better father, keep my family better, and for them to, I wish I was more effective and more loving and more everything because I want my family, a great family. And God says, well, you're not going to make it, but I'm creating a family. And I've done all the awesome, awesome, great, great, great work. I've taken the judgment for you. I've done everything for you. Now you are my sons through Jesus Christ. I baptize you into my family. I give you my name. I even give you my righteousness, redemption, wisdom. And that's what it means by clothing ourselves with Christ. You see? And so Paul is arguing in Galatians chapter 3, believers, Galatians, don't pay attention to his false teachers. They're messing you over. In Christ, you are already children of God. <clears throat> Verse 27, again, for all who, or you who were baptized into, the, into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And once that happens, <sighs> there's no comparison anymore. There's no more competition. There's no more fear. I'm going to be left out. And what are usually the divisions? Uh, you're a Mexican. Uh, you're Japanese. You are Polak. You are a Nazi. You are social, right? Or uh, you are poor. Or you are, oh, you're a woman. Sorry. Oh, you're a dog. Oh, we make these distinctions. You're a dirty Mexican. Trailer trash. I mean, name it. Don't we call ourselves that way? And look at the next verse of what Paul says. He says now in verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. 
We're no longer divided by nationality or social distinctions. They're done away with in Christ. Jew or Gentile, racial, those things are gone. Slave or free, social economic distinctions, they're gone. Male or female, gender distinctions, gone. No more comparison, competition, fear of being different, of being left out. But you see, you and I will not experience that unless we live by faith in Christ. We're still going to live by this distinction, by this old taste, by this old way of thinking. Oh, I wish I was born a female. Oh, I wish I was born a male. Oh, I wish... Like, what? There's no more Jew or Gentile. No more male or female. No more fear. And if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough freedom, look at the next verse. Verse 29. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Wow. You know, I mean, just think of it back in people when they were, well, uh, I'm part of Bill Gates' family. Whoop, set for life. Uh, I'm part of the Rockefeller family. Whoop, set for life. Right? I'm related to, Paul says, there's been a few thousand years gone by and there's the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians. Billions of people over thousands of years claiming Abraham as their forefather. Well, guess what? In Christ, you are Abraham's offspring. And if you are Abraham's offspring, you are in the line of blessing. Of all the promises that God gave to Abraham, you, believer, are an heir of Abraham. Wow! Do you see why I call this a privileged people? But we forget. We don't go by that. And so then we live life with fear and anger and, and competition and all these things that drag us down. They drag us down. So then, how do we apply this truth that through Christ believers are placed in a great position of acceptance and privilege? Well, you know, I tell people, because many of us, we, we want to we wanna live by faith. We want to trust God. Oh, I want to trust God more. Oh, I want to trust God more. And, and we get through all these things and we're all frustrated. Even though we want to trust God. The reason? Because we're not identifying the idols in which we are trusting in. And so then it becomes very hard to trust God. I want to trust God and by the time you know it, boom, you're pulled back by your idols. And if you don't identify your idols, you're not going to let go as much as you want to trust God. And so part of it is, look at, you know what? I am going to submit to the gospel. Meaning, I'm going to submit to the way God saves me. I used to think, and I'm still thinking, that the way I'm going to be saved, the way I'm going to be accepted, the way I'm going to be a part of whatever I want to be a part of is by me performing. No, I'm going to let go of that. And I'm going to submit to the gospel that says, through Jesus Christ who died for me, I am accepted by God. And if God accepts me, who are you? <laughs> We're all a bunch of little sinners. So, if you don't like me, you don't even hold any water compared to God. But as long as we're afraid, we're saying, you have so much power over my soul. I have to, I have to, I have to have your acceptance or I can't live. That's not submitting to the gospel. 
That's not submitting to the way God saves us. And so the first application is submit to the gospel. Accept the way of God's salvation, not your own winning of approval and acceptance. You already, already, did you hear that? Already accepted in Jesus Christ. And it can change our life profoundly. Profoundly. Application number two, verse 26, you're all sons of God. It is a family of God. But like any other family, what does it require? To be a part of that family. Meaning being involved. Being involved in that family. I mean, you know, most of us know now what are teenagers like. Well, at a certain age, at, you know, 13, 14, they go into their room and disappear for two or three years. They're gone, man. Where are they? Poof! <laughs> you can't find them. They don't want to be a part of the family. And then something happened. Well, how come nobody told me? Well, you were in Arabia. <laughs> Where were you? And no, like in any part, any other family, we need to be involved and commit. Are there going to be problems? Well, of course. We were sitting there in the kitchen, or I had just walked in. David was sitting on the couch watching TV. Desiree was over there on the counter eating her food. And David just decides to flip a, a, a pillow over to Desiree. No warning, no nothing. <laughs> Boom! And there's beans and rice on her computer and a fight. Here we go. <laughs> I mean, are we going to avoid things like that? Well, we can try. But that's being part of the family. I mean, it took, you know, a good 45 minutes, an hour. And, <laughs> I mean, I wish it wasn't that way. I wish it was peaceful. I wish the Martinez family were like, oh, perfect. Peace. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Please. <laughs> it just doesn't happen that way. But that's being a part of the family. And guess what? It's going to be the same way in the church. And the response is, well, I'm going to stay away. Those Christians, I'll show them. <laughs> what is that? Behaving like little teenagers. That's how it's at. No. No. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 25. Because this is what's happening today, right? So many people are rejecting the church. Because there's so many problems. But look at what the Word of God says. Not the latest psychological journal. Not the latest religious guru. No, this is what God says. Not my own logical thinking. I see all this and I figure out the church, so I'm not going to be a part of that. No, 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 no. This is what God says. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together. That is the, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. I think the longer I pastor, the more I realize I need to love people but once they start saying no and no, I need to let go. I need to let go. There's no more sacrifice for sin. They're going to try and do it on their own. <clears throat> it hurts. Don't stop getting together. There's always, always going to be reasons and... Well, excuses. But, two verses before, verse 24. 
but let us consider, to consider, to think about, to put mental energy into it. That too has been a realization for me. Anytime you want to, I want to accomplish something, there's no way, no way, no way, no way around me having to put some mental energy into it. Otherwise, it's a botched job. And the more time I put into it, well, the better it's going to be. Well, guess what? Look at what verse 24 says. But, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. There's thousands of things that need this word, this church needs. Many things that you, this church needs. And we all need to put our heads together and say, how can we help one another? We have our young children. We have our teenagers. We have our young couples. We have the singles. We have all kinds of needs. And each one of us to say, well, how can I participate? How can I stimulate others to good, love and good deeds? You see, that's being part of the family. That's being part of the family. Someone is not part of the family, guess what? They're not going to value the family. They're not going to value the family. You see? I'm going to do my own thing. Finally, before I open it up for your questions or your comments, listen, we need to be encouraged that God has built His family. We need to be encouraged because it is dark out there. It is a dog eat dog. And some of us that have been out there in the darkness in years past, if not now, know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a dog eat dog. And God says, I've taken a people and I put my spirit in them and I gave them my word. This is the family of God. God is working something great. God is working something great, but we must be a part of that work of God. Once again, Ephesians, this is my last application, uh, last passage, Ephesians uh, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, this is God's work. Chapter 4 and verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by every waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. It's the work of God. It's the family of God. And God is at work and it's wonderful to see it. It's wonderful. And so, you know, for us that are here, the few of us that are here this, morning, this afternoon, uh, you know, to pass it on to others. To pass it on to others. Because again, the world's going to pull us this way and that way and our work is going to demand this or that and then bill play, paying and the, the, the foul language and here we go. And we need to come back to what's truly important, to what God is doing, to what God is doing, building His family, building His church, so that you and I can be a part of it and experience the blessings of God, the work of God. We're heirs of Abraham, offspring of Abraham. And all the promises that God gave to Abraham, the land and blessings and honor and peace and joy, it's what God is working for us. But we need to decide to be a part of it. Believers are placed in this awesome position of acceptance and privilege.